experienced some big changes like the powerful women that you've seen come up here today. Yeah? Well, hopefully I'm going to have some information to help. But you're lucky I'm here at all because I almost talked myself out of it. <laughs> I'm a lot more confident, actually. This is me. <laughs> but I'm a lot more confident in the kickboxing ring rather than on a stage like this. But as you're going to learn today, this was a survival mode that I lived for far too long in. For now, let it be said that it took weeks. I just for weeks was blocked on what I was going to talk about. I was torturing myself. I was telling myself these stories like, I'm not good enough to pull it off. No one's going to want to hear my story. And I was really stuck behind this overwhelming feeling of shame. And that was drawing me to call to that was causing me to draw a blank on the words, on the action. So for weeks, I, I just did nothing. <laughs> and I recognized this experience because almost 16 years ago to the day, I stood outside a Chilean police station with my story laying really heavy on my heart. Only that day, I decided to turn around and walk away and stay silent. And I've dreamt about that night. I've dreamt about it all that day. I've dreamt about it over and over again. And it's this recurring nightmare of feeling really, really lost in the city of Santiago, getting on these buses, going up and down these blocks, and really feeling like there was something important to do, but actually never, never, never getting there. And I think that that feeling of frustration and chaos actually represents the majority of the last 16 years for me, um, where, yeah, I mean, I think it was only recently that I, I really realized that there was something important to do and, and start about doing it. And before that, I was just existing in this survival mode and locked within the confines of my own mind. Did you know that most of your memories leave no trace on your brain? If you think about it, if you think back to childhood, how much of it do you actually remember? And how much of it is stories that have been recounted to you? When I was a kid, I was your classic Swallows and Amazons kid. I'm not sure if that's a British thing or if you know the series of books, but the first one was all about adventure. There was these two kids and they camped under the open sky, swam in the lake, fished for dinner, and then they met Amazon pirates that came and challenged them to war. That was me. Life was such an adventure. I couldn't actually sleep. I wanted to be a BBC journalist and travel the world and report on danger, the most dangerous stories. Um, yeah, I was, just, I was just one of those kids. And in my book, Life Through a Lens, I talk about... Um, being eight years old and there was this tree at the bottom of my garden that my mum always told us not to climb. She told us all the reasons not to climb it and she'd watch us at the kitchen window to make sure we weren't climbing it. And as soon as she turned around, I'd be up the tree and I'd be climbing to my heart's content and I didn't fear the fall. And that's because I hadn't fallen yet. And then one day my foot slipped and I fell out the tree, legs akimbo onto my bike up below the tree. You literally couldn't have planned a, a more accurate fall. And I let out such a scream and my mum came running down the garden, full pelt, cursing all the reasons why I shouldn't have climbed the tree and how she's surprised nothing was broken. And the thing was, my lady parts felt really broken for weeks actually. And it, you know, I had to use an ice pack to sit down and it hurt to pee. And the next time I stood in front of a tree, like however tall the branches were, however enticing the twistedness of them was, I wasn't going to go up that tree again. I thought twice. And that's because I, my brain was smart and I'd experienced something and it didn't want me to experience that again. And in that moment, I actually rewired my brain physically. That survival mode I should have clicked over a while ago. <laughs> so, after I was drugged and raped in South America, whilst I was traveling around South America in 2004, all of a sudden the world didn't really seem such an adventure. 
I, it seems actually really scary. And I stopped trusting myself. I stopped, stopped trusting other people. And I felt, again, this overwhelming sense of shame. And so much shame that I hardly told anyone that it had happened to me. Um, I believed it was my fault. And I guess I didn't really want to feel everything that telling the story would make me feel. I truly believed I'd caused it to happen in some way. And the shame of that made me feel exposed and vulnerable in every way. And shame became the reason I couldn't. Shame made me feel like I was never enough. Shame made me feel like my voice was not worth hearing. And shame meant that I wasn't living out my soul goal. And by soul goal, I mean that one deep purpose that you feel like you've been born onto this earth for. How many of you are carrying around feelings like that that are holding you back? How many of you have your own stories that are limiting you? When I discovered biohacking, I began to think differently about my feelings and my story. Biohacking is living better with the help of science and without going into too much detail, it's positively manipulating our personal chemistry with the types of things that people have talked about today, those habits, routines, even our nutrition. So this ladder <laughs> demonstrates just one of the ways that biohacking has completely changed my life. And it's a concept by Stephen Porges, who is a scientist that specializes in traumatic stress response. It gives us a way to overpower our neuroception. And in doing so, we escape those confines of our mind. And I know you're thinking, Claire, you've got a shitload out of a ladder, but bear with me. <laughs> I'm going to go into it in detail for you. So neuroception is something that's way beneath our awareness and what we generally consider our conscious control because it's always listening. It's always listening to what's happening in our bodies, around our bodies, and also in our connection to others. <clears throat> so with this ladder and a wearable technology that I wear on my wrist that tracks my body's responses to actual stress triggers, I became fascinated as to how I could control my brain, which feels out of our control, our nervous system, which feels even more out of our control, and how the two interrelate. Bear with me. <laughs> so, I began to understand that my nervous system is part of this complex surveillance system, like a personal surveillance system, and it's always on guard, right? It's always asking in every moment, is this safe? And the thing is that it's directed, it's programming, it's directed by our experiences. And it's built into us for protection, but it's faulty beyond our primitive existence. And I'm gonna tell you why. Number one, as humans, we're built, we're wired to apply meaning to everything. Why did that happen to me? What does that mean about the world? And secondly, in modern life, in modern society, we have overstimulation that we never had when we were primitive beings. Artificial lights, constant sounds, stress, even our mobile phones are muddying the waters of what is actual stress triggers, what are actual cues of safety, danger, and life threat. So this takes a silent and autonomic process and turns it into um, a story, actually. A story that shapes our identity and it frames our action. And so many of us find ourselves in that survival mode. In that survival mode where we're playing small and our purpose and our, 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 that soul goal is lost to this primitive defense um, system and we're not living in alignment with our true purpose anymore. So I spent actually nine years, nine years in that survival mode, and now I know I should have always been here impacting you, doing something like this. And sure, I learned stuff and I grew, but fighting was selfish. It was a way for me to feel powerful. It was a way for me to feel like 
somebody's just fallen out my back. Um, to feel like I was overpowering rather than being the one that was being overpowered. And I was risking my, my health, potentially my life, for a goal that was deeply out of alignment with my soul goal. So what's going on in your brain as you're living in this survival mode? So under threat identified by our neuroception, our brain's making decisions without our conscious control. So a bunch of those decisions that um, we just talked about, like we're absolutely not aware of them. And a great example of this is date rape, because I had these horrifying recollections of being physically paralyzed, being unable to move. And what played in my mind was not understanding why at the same time I could feel physical pain. I could feel pain between my legs. I could feel, you know, my, I could even feel my tears. And I couldn't understand why didn't I fight then? Why wasn't I fighting like my life meant something? With such physical feeling present, why was I immobilized? And Dr. Stephen Porges helped me to understand this because he helped me to understand the neural neurobiology of our responses to threat. Under situations of extreme threat, yes, we fight or we flee, but we also retain this primitive response to freeze under severe life threat. So I was indeed fighting for my life by playing dead. And my thoughts, my feelings, my intentions in that moment, they, they didn't mean anything. <coughs> but in the days, weeks, months following what happened to me, they meant everything as I was applying meaning, as I was applying meaning to that experience. My part in it, why it happened, why I got picked out, what it meant about men, what it meant about actually any relationship with any human being, what it meant about traveling, what it meant about the world and how to stay safe. That meaning created stories, stories that enabled my trauma to stay on the tracks. They kept me in limbo between the past, the present and the future. And like I said, they shaped my identity. They shaped how I showed up. And this is where biohacking really comes in. We can biohack emotional trauma by interrogating the meaning that we took in the moment to use our conscious mind to change that meaning and physically rewire our brain in a positive way. It just so happened that I did this writing my book, Life Through a Lens, because it was a way for me to really understand the meaning that I'd applied in the moment, understand those feelings that were causing those stories to replay and causing me to not take action, and I was empowered to do something differently. Shame's a terrible habit, um, and it is a habit. It could even be a, a sorry, an in inherited habit, because every single cell in our body stores memory, and 95% of our life is on automation. So in order to break my negative <coughs> patterns and heal from my experience, I had to neutralize that feeling of shame. And there's a really key point here. You can't feel shame if you don't believe there's anything to be ashamed about. So I had a bunch of science stuff, but that like has gone really fast. <laughs> but I am doing a workshop in a minute, which I'm gonna go into the detail of how you can actually physically rewire your brain and what's going up in this big pink matter up here. <laughs> um, and to finish, I just want to say, for me, it was using that perspective. It was that, it was that, you know, using the perspective to change the meaning. And you can figure out what your vehicle is to activate a new response, to feel something different. So, biohacking enables you to operate from a place of power not force. There is power in healing and moving forward rather than being forced by a biological need to feel protected and safe. I like to call myself a recovered survivor now. 
that I don't think surviving is a good thing. I think that it's something that is celebrated in our world where we're just actually putting up with the feelings that we have and there's more power in overcoming and moving forward. And like the beautiful Amanda said, turning that pain into purpose. When we're turning that pain into purpose, we're taking action like we've never taken before. We're actually empowered to take risks because we're no longer worried about our future based on the pain of our past. We live in the present moment and it's in the present moment that the magic happens. That's where you have the power to show up in your true potential. And you're making conscious decisions in the present moment. Instead of replaying those negative patterns from before, you can step into your power. Yes, you have a story. You have a story, but holding on to it is silencing the truth and it's immobilizing the action that could create a whole new chapter in your life. So I want to ask you, what are you what are you wanting to do in life but you're not showing up and doing it because of fear, because of unworthiness, because of shame, or any other emotion? And what can you do to change your perspective and rewire your brain to let go of that emotion and leverage your story to help others? What if your deepest, darkest moments are a candle of hope for others that you actually haven't set a light yet? And in the days, months, actually even years following my experience, my trauma, I wondered how my life could ever be the same. And now I'm actually really happy and grateful that it won't. So underneath your chair is a sheet of paper <laughs> that looks like this. I do have a training which is called Superhuman Secrets Training that's free and if you'd like to learn more about this and you'd like to learn how you can rewire your brain positively then grab a pen, put your name on it, put your email on it and then send it back in the door or put it on, send it to the girl in the pretty dress. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.